Hello, everybody. This is Mike Young, and I'm here with a friend of mine from way back, Hassan Walla, and we are going to talk about autonomous driving, specifically level five. And Hassan, welcome. Please give us like a, so some of your background as to how you are informed and knowledgeable in this space. Thank you, Mike. Uh, great to be here. So uh, I am the uh, chief customer officer at Telenap. Uh, we're one of the leading uh, software suppliers in the connected car space. Uh, currently, we offer connected navigation uh, for General Motors and Ford globally and Toyota in North America, as well as several other automotive OEMs. So I've been involved in this uh, navigation space, the connected car space, now for more than 14 years at Telenav. And certainly as the cars have become connected uh, and as we move towards self-driving, you know, we've been looking at not just having navigation for the human driver, but how do we make navigation available for the autonomous vehicles? Okay, perfect. So yeah, everybody's autonomous is like the, uh, the dream at this point in time anyway. And I know there's different levels. We want to focus on level five. So can you define what level five autonomous driving is? Yeah, so I think you know, level five has a slightly different meaning to everybody. For me, level five uh, autonomous driving means I can get in my car, I can take a nap and I wake up and I'm at my destination, whether it's 10 miles away or whether it's a 400 mile trip, I, I go to sleep in uh, DC and I wake up in New York or, or vice versa. And it'll navigate on highways, on small roads, uh, even on you know areas under construction, inclement weather, all of those things. That that is you know, level five. Okay. Yeah. I mean that sounds wonderful, and uh, I can't wait to see it. And uh, you and I are both. We've been around for a while. You know, I was I was I think we were both born in were you born I can't nineteen seventies when I was born. I'm already fifty. I think you're almost fifty. Are almost. You? I was born in seventy one. So yeah. So I've reached the age of wisdom, right? You're you're almost there. Although you're probably wiser than I am in this category, <laughs> I would say. So we've seen it all. We've, I mean, I, I couldn't even imagine this stuff when I was young, but it's here and people are talking about it. One of the things you hear all the time, because I own a Tesla, is Elon Musk talking about this. So what kind of a time frame are we looking at? And is, are his timelines at all accurate? Well, so I think uh, Tesla is a fantastic car and Elon is you know, certainly one of the visionaries in our space. But I think uh, there is also a, a concern that sometimes you get too over aggressive. Uh, my, my biggest issue with Tesla is the fact that they call their semi-autonomous driving autopilot, which almost people, which makes people think it's like an airplane that flies and you put it on autopilot and you can fly by itself Correct. Uh, while the technology isn't there. And I think the timelines that Elon has been, has provided around Tesla, I believe it was supposed to be level five autonomous last August. So it hasn't happened. Yeah, uh, I think you, you pushed it off to the end of this year, but still, even the end of this year is seems like it's too soon. Yeah. So you know, sometimes it all depends on your definition of level five. So my definition of level five that I just gave, uh, definitely not happening this year, and I'm not sure if it happens in you know in our lifetime, uh, okay. where you could truly have an autonomous car that could navigate anywhere freely, regardless of road conditions. Um, you know, the type of environment, whether it's urban or, or highway, can handle everything. Okay, so what has to happen? What needs to be developed? What technology needs to be out there to make this work and work correctly? Yeah, so I think a lot of people focus on what has to go into the vehicle itself. And I think the in-car technology is improving very rapidly. And you can have you know, smart vehicles that can look around, make a lot of decisions. But a lot of autonomous driving now, it is still relying on things like road markers. You know, it, uh, you know the cars cannot pick up whether, you know, where traffic lights are. Uh, as, as human beings, we can perceive you know, whether the light is red, green, yellow, even if it's a bright day. But most autonomous cars you know, are, are looking for, for certain visual cues. And if they're not there, uh, even, even though they may have the best cameras, the best LIDAR, it, it cannot make those intelligent decisions. So uh, we need to focus not only on the vehicle itself, we also have to look at what has to go in the infrastructure side. Hmm. So on the infrastructure so side, it needs to you know, go into the smart cities concept. 
where the, uh, the, the city or the roads have to be able to communicate with the, the vehicle. So if, there's, there, if you're in an urban environment or a suburban environment and there's a traffic light up ahead, it should tell the, the uh, vehicle as it's approaching it, look, light is red. Right. So it can start to slow down and it knows the exact location. Uh, that's why, you know, even if you have a car that's perfect, it's, uh, I very much see it uh, feasible to have level five type of autonomous driving in very limited areas where you do have the infrastructure in place to support it. Uh, and uh, this is one of the reasons why, you know, GM Super Cruise, uh, which is a, a competitor of Tesla, you know, it's been set up so it only can be, uh, oper uh, be operated on highways where they have a high definition map available. So I think how, the, how does it know? I mean, is it just GPS based? How, how does it know where those boundaries are? Oh, yes, it is, it is GPS based. So based on where you are, uh, you know, it only lets you um, uh, turn on Super Cruise once you're in an area where they have a high definition map. So with the high definition map, uh, even, if you, even if it's raining out and you, and you can't quite see the, the road markings, it tends to be accurate to within a couple of centimeters. So it can still keep the, the car in, you, in your lane. But the issue there is that high definition map is not in real time. So if there is construction, if ah. roads have changed, uh, so, that, so this is where the infrastructure part comes in. What about like if there's an accident in front of you and there's stopped vehicles? Yeah, so, so there you typically have sensors in the vehicle now. I think uh, automated braking has been around for a very long time. Right, and uh, it can use uh, radar for automated braking. So things like that can be can be dealt with. But if you're dealing with again bad weather, you know, missing road markings, especially construction. Uh, sometimes you have construction, and they may go from a, a four lane road to a three lane road, and they have to put in now new markings. So it's very easy for camera based sensors to to get confused and you know, figure out well, you know, should I be between these two markers or the others? because they might be, be uh, running uh, right next to each other. Okay, this, this has got me thinking, is there, are there two different camps here? Are there two different thought patterns here? I mean, because you're talking about an integrated system with the infrastructure. And I know from what I understand of Tesla and Elon Musk, they're talking about just a simple visual system where it's like a human with eyes in the back of their head and they're just processing as they go. Uh, are these two different schools of thought? Well, uh, not not necessarily, because uh, I think even even with you know what what Tesla is doing, the infrastructure only improves it. It just makes it so much better. Right. So there is so much you can do. I think for highway based driving, what uh, Tesla has now or, or what GM has now is is very good. Uh, still has room for improvement, but for highway based driving where you do not have intersections, you don't have traffic lights, and for the most part, the roads are marked well, right. Uh, there, these camera-based systems, I think, work, work quite well. The issue always happens, you know, when you uh, get off the highway. Right, yeah. right. Because right, it, is, it is, I agree, it's, it's so much easier on the highway. There are just that many fewer possibilities that, that can happen. And I'm not familiar with the GM system. Is the GM system, of, I mean, what, what does the sensor suite look like in the GM? I'm familiar with the sensor suite and the Tesla, it's not the GM. Yeah, so... I'm not an expert on, on, on the sensor suite at GM. I do know that I think uh, things they've shared publicly that they are using high definition maps. Uh, that might be one, one difference. It is also camera based, but it is, uh, so it's not only relying on uh, the camera, but it is re relying on the high definition maps for accuracy as well to yeah. keep the, the, the vehicle on track. Okay, I see that. Now, here's another question that's been brought up over time. The, the issue of LIDAR, what do you see happening with LIDAR? Is it required? Is it not required? What's going on? Yeah, so I think you've seen with some of the, uh, you know, the crashes that the autonomous Teslas have been involved with, that so far uh, camera-based systems alone you know, cannot um, uh, look at every single possibility, especially under extreme conditions. That's where I think LIDAR will be helpful. I think LIDAR, the price of the overall hardware is coming down. And I do believe it is going to play a major role in the future of autonomous driving. Okay, because you, I remember watching the Elon Musk 
presentation about a year ago for Autonomous Day, and someone asked him a question about LIDAR, and he, I think his response was that it's a fool's errand. That, that, that was his response, and that kind of floored me. I didn't, I never heard anyone say that. I, I, I think up to that point, I think everyone was thinking, well, Tesla's just got it all wrong. And then when he answered that question, he kind of flipped it around and said, no, you guys have it all wrong. So what do you make of all of this? I mean, can everyone have a place in here? Can, can, can there be multiple different systems or is one going to have to win over the other? Yeah, so, so I'm not the, tech, the hardware expert. Uh, I do believe there will be different approaches. Uh, we've already seen GM and Tesla take different approaches. There will be a LiDAR based approach to non and LiDAR based, and they'll all have their limitations. And ultimately, on very high end premium vehicles where there are higher margins, uh, you'll have the ability to have the best of all worlds. On uh, you know, more of the, the uh, middle tier vehicles, it's probably not affordable to put, right. put everything in. Do you think initially or long term, will, will there always be different levels depending upon your budget? I think, well, so if you look at it, right, everything goes through a product cycle. There used to be a time where uh, anti-log brakes were an option. Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I can't remember they someone. They available. <laughs> yes, going, going to a car now. Uh, so I, I think the, the same way with uh, autonomous driving or semi-autonomous driving, there will be certain features that will become just standard. I think, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, you have cruise control, that's been around for a long time. And then you have adaptive cruise control, which maintains distance with the vehicle in front of you. So you don't need to constantly speed up, you know, brake. Uh, I think, you know, to have uh, the next iteration, you know, of um, uh, cruise control as GM called the super cruise, right? right? So things like that, I believe will become standard where on, on, on highways, more and more people will be able to have truly hands-free systems. I think right now you have hands-free systems, but it still requires eyes on the road. So the, right. the one, one thing which the GM system does is it does track your eye movement. And if it notices that you're not paying attention, it will try to get you to pay attention. Yeah, that, you've mentioned that to me before, and I have, I'm not familiar with that, but that sounds like it makes sense because I will tell you from my own experience with the Tesla system, I can turn that on at, on any road at any speed. Now, it used to be that they limited me I had to be going at least 18 miles an hour until recent software upgrades, but now I can go down to one mile an hour. Yes. And I can do it anywhere, which surprises me, you know, because there's, that's why I asked you about the GPS location with the GM system, because I, it would seem to me that they could, they would know where I am and they would know whether it's safe or not, but they still allow me to turn the system on, you know? And I can tell you, there's been all kinds of weird stuff that have happened on certain roads, but I've been there to, to control the car. And ultimately, I think the way that they have it set up, it's still the responsibility of the driver because yeah. level five would be no driver responsibility, right? Is that another thing that level five would be? Absolutely. So level five doesn't need a steering wheel, right? It's, there's no steering wheel needed. It's a car that completely drives by itself. And uh, again, you know, I think you know, Tesla has been really a technology leader in this space. You know, one of the areas where Tesla has really excelled in has been over the air uh, software updates. They believe they're doing this better than any other OEM, and the ability that going to, forward. That's like a, that's something something that will be happening in most cars going forward. Absolutely, I think every OEM realizes not just for autonomous driving, but in general, if automotive uh, OEMs want to compete with consumer electronics, people change their phone on average every two years. A car's <laughs> lifetime is ten years, so they they have to uh, not only um, have over the air software updates but they need to start planning for hardware in general where it has a longer lifespan than, you know, than your phone does. Okay, yeah, a couple quick questions are, are revolving that. Um, you mentioned to me, first of all, certifying vehicles, say like for a level five, you would hit your vehicle would have to be certified to be on the road, which makes sense to me. I never heard that before. Can you explain that? Yeah, so you know, uh, right now, it is, as, as you mentioned, it is the driver's responsibility to have the, the vehicle in, in good shape. If your taillight is busted and a police officer pulls you over, it's your responsibility, mm -hmm. right? And you will get the uh, ticket. Right. If your brakes don't work, uh, maybe you could blame the, the manufacturer, but you're the one that tests it. All these shops, they're certified. 
So first it is, you know, with autonomous driving, it's going to be uh, uh, if there is a car that has to go through maintenance, who will certify that now it's good enough to get back in, in service? We will have to retrain our entire maintenance industry. Right. Uh, they will need to get certified that, look, yes, uh, I, I certify you know, this car's brakes were changed and it meets all the specifications for level five. But not just the certification for service, the insurance companies have to get involved. So they will have to, so the infrastructure goes you know, beyond just what a, a city does, but it is uh, the whole infrastructure around maintenance, around insurance, you know, around making sure that if, uh, uh, you know, while it, it might be very remote, people always talk about if two autonomous cars get into a car accident, who determines fault, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but I would say even if one autonomous car hits a manual driving car, you know, somebody has to, to determine fault. Uh, and then after servicing, somebody has to make sure that it is certified to uh, get back in. And, you know, the, the whole insurance company in, in U.S. is regulated on a state by state basis. Right. So every state will have to come up with its own rules. Perhaps it goes you know, national. And then the insurance companies have to look at the risk that it poses. So while I feel the autonomous technology can bring in a lot of safety and improve um, uh, driving conditions, if it's uh, used in, in a reckless manner, it could have the opposite effect. So it might be that nobody ever wants to go into autonomous mode because their insurance <laughs> rates go up. Wow. Okay. I hadn't thought about that because I keep hearing that the insurance rates would be less, but yeah, if it's done wrong, then it'd be a disaster for sure. Yes. How about the concept of appreciating assets? Would a, would a fully autonomous vehicle actually go up in value or be, not be a depreciating asset anyway? What are, you, what are your views on that? Well, I think um, that's you know, whether uh, the value goes up, uh, it uh, depends on the, the machine learning algorithms, right? So you will have some local machine learning, but a lot of it is going to be on the cloud side. So uh, I think an important asset in, uh, for companies like Tesla is the fact that they have a lot of data back from their vehicles, but it's all in, in the cloud. So over time, uh, the vehicles will get smarter, not just from what is built in from the factory, but from what they observe. But most of that should be shared back with the cloud so that the, the auto manufacturer can use that across all of their fleet. So I don't know if the asset will appreciate necessarily, but I think it can be much more efficiently used. Uh, for me right now, my, my car sits in my uh, garage, right. probably you know, you know, 22 hours to 23 hours per day uh, because I, I work from home. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it'll be great from efficiency improvement if even if I don't want it to be out all the time, you know, at night, it could be a self-driving Uber, you know, a ride healing uh, vehicle uh, yeah. or some other ride sharing. One of the things I thought it was intriguing is that let's say you want to go downtown for a night on the weekend. The way it is in today's world, you either have to get on public transportation, arrange all that, or you have to get an Uber, or you have to try to go downtown and find a parking spot. Where in a level five world, I'm thinking, well, I can just drive myself downtown or the car will drive me, drop me off and go earn money for me in the urban downtown area while I'm Absolutely. out on the town and then pick me up when I'm done. So you'd actually gain money in that scenario. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the next time you go watch a movie, you go to a baseball game where, you know, for three hours, you're in downtown DC and you don't need your, your vehicle, but there is a high demand for ride healing. They could certainly do that. Or, I mean, even, you know, there are other simpler use cases. Uh, you know, one, one of the, the big reasons that I don't rent cars when I, I, I fly is you, once you land at an airport, you have to now go and pick up your car. You may have to take a train there, a bus, and then coming back, it's the same process. It adds time. Right. So when you're, you know, traveling, you have a car that just, you know, that is your rental car, even if it's not fully autonomous it can just come and pick you up from the terminal. And it's very easy for them to have that one or two miles mapped, you know, with the infrastructure in place. And afterwards you drive it yourself. When you are done, you come back, pull up to the terminal, get off and the car goes and parks, its, parks itself. So even automated valet parking, right? You, you go to a, a concert and there is always a long line, not just to get in, but at the parking lots. So a car that can drop you off and then of course, it's great if it can earn money, 
But if it can just do something as simple as go park itself. Right. And then if you tell it, look, my, my concert is over at this time, half an hour before that, it pulls out of the uh, parking lot and, and come and picks you up. I think, uh, you know, just from a convenience perspective, there are a lot of use cases. Okay, right. All right, well, final question. What kind of a timeline are we looking at for this vision of level five? Yeah, so my, my vision of, of level five, where you could get in, in, a, in a driverless vehicle that can go anywhere in, let's say, the continental US, um, I think is uh, probably not happening in my lifetime. But I think uh, a level five that can operate in certain areas, uh, whether it's I know a college campus, uh, whether it's um, you know in uh, certain urban areas where they have the infrastructure, I think uh, that could happen in the next 10, 15 years. Uh, or level five type of driving, uh, which is only uh, on, on highways. I think that that is something that we'll definitely see in our, our lifetime. Right now, uh, most of, of the systems, they'll you know, give you a, a warning that you still may pay attention. So being able to get on a highway and actually take not just your hands off the wheel, but take your eyes off the road, I think that is the, you know, uh, uh, the next big thing. Right? How, Where, how far out? How far out is that? I think, I think we could probably get there in the next 10 years. All right. Okay, well, I don't know if my car will even be around then. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe the next car will have something. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you, Hassan, from Telenav. And I hope that we can have you know, more discussions as this technology develops and people become more aware of it and more curious. They're going to want to hear more details. So well, thanks so much for your knowledge uh, and, and sharing with us. Thank you, Mike.